start off the uh, the storytelling uh, session uh, or part of the session this morning. Um, we're delighted um, that uh, my daughter, who is uh, Kira, who's in uh, year 12 um, at Kashmir High School um, here in Otadahi, Christchurch, um, has kindly um, agreed to, to be part of the conversation. And uh, Kira is going to uh, share a few thoughts and then engage um, in a bit of conversation with Jocelyn and Chan. Um, so, uh, sorry, folks. Can I, can can I just ask that people make sure that they um, put themselves on mute, please? Thank you. So, uh, Kira, um, I believe you're there. So, um, going to hand over to you and and um, enjoy your conversation um, with Chan and and Jocelyn. Got it, everyone. So, uh, like. Alan Dad said, I'm Kira, I go to Kashmir, um, I'm 16. And yeah, I just had a few thoughts to share about how I think education needs to kind of shift to sort of um, create more education around the SDGs and how they can be more involved, like ingrained in, in um, education. So sort of the, the main thing, the main idea kind of thought that I had around how education needs to change is that there needs to be a shift in culture within the schools um, to a point where the SDGs are just a way of doing things and learning about the SDGs and just like having them within the school culture is, and it's just it's just what you do so the same way that for example like in all my classes now um, teachers have a call, a call popper for the lesson the same way that that's just part of something that teachers do and and you just have in your lessons um, the SDGs can be valued and ingrained in a school environment in the same sort of way and the 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 first thing that I thought needed to be done is that there actually just needed to be some education just kind of generally within teachers um, so a lot of my I, I've at my school I've um, talked to a lot of people about the SDGs and um, a couple of my teachers and stuff and I've done some, some of my assessments I've sort of written about the SDGs and one of my teachers had absolutely no idea what I was talking about and she was pretty skeptical about my topic of for my writing because she had no idea what it was um, and I've had that same experience with some with my head of school who didn't know what the SDGs were so but I think one of the beginning places for that is that teachers actually are just know what the SDGs are and actually are just exposed to them because yeah. I think that yeah. it's such, it's not common knowledge at all for people to know not what the SDGs are. Sorry, um, yeah. carry on. <laughs> so that, that's <clears throat> sort of the first thing and then from there um, teachers can then teach their students and sort of integrate the SDGs into their lessons more and then students will be able to take that on board and sort of if they're if it's if it begins with being ingrained in, in lessons and in school life then it can further apply like when students go outside or they're in school or if they're outside of school like on the weekends and stuff they can sort of have that they sort of know and have the knowledge of the SDGs and can apply them more into their life but yeah that's sort of my initial thoughts about how it's Education would need a shift. Uh, kia ora, Kira. It's Shan here. Um, uh, my question, because we talked about this yesterday, so my question was that popped up today is you're obviously really interested and engaged in the SDGs, but um, you kind of mentioned that some teachers aren't aware of them, but also other young people, children and young people aren't aware of them. Have you? Got any ideas on how you, we, or everyone could engage more children and young people in the SDGs? Like to make um, it interesting to them and relevant to them? Yeah, so I think that like with the SDGs, because they cover such a broad range of sort of um, social and environmental issues, there, there are lots of ways to engage students who have lots of different interests, which I think is a really something really cool about the SDGs. Like if you're interested in sort of like child poverty or have passion for um, like infrastructure, there's SDGs that cover both of that. And I think that just one of the key things is like, I don't know, just like that initial being a like 
students actually like know they exist and I think that from there if if sort of teachers are in, uh, weaving them into into lessons more and sort of you know like I, I'm not I'm not I'm not exactly sure like how that would be done but like say yeah weaving them into lessons more so that students are sort of learning about what the SDGs mean while they're in class or you know while they're doing their lessons and they're applied to situations which are already sort of known already by students it would be a, it would be more engaging and then yeah students would be able so, to engage further with so them. I've got I've got a follow-on question that would kind of links into that so kia ora Kira it's Jocelyn here uh just thinking about you know to kind of get a, a school started which which kind of learning areas do you think it would be easier for perhaps teachers to bring in conversations or, or learning uh, experiences around SDGs? Do you, do you have any thoughts on which subjects or learning areas would be the best to start with? Um, just something that pops into my head um, pretty quickly is some of the social sciences type of area, um, geography, classics, history, um, also at my school it was social studies and year nine and ten that was compulsory that kind of covered all of those and you know in in those classes um, there's sort of a lot of a, a, you can sort of because um, it's like the study of how like people are interacting and stuff it sort of really quickly applies to the SDGs um, especially like geography and stuff like that where you're sort of some of the standards that are available to do a um, focus have Sort of um people and sustainability focus um in it already and i also think that things like english where it's um a lot of like oh i don't know at my school we do like writing folios and um like um film analysis and stuff you can sort of choose um resources within those standards that can link more to sdgs so i think that a couple of those subjects would be Good place to start in schools. And I have one more question. I was just thinking if you were going to do a pitch to say your principal or the board or even the Minister of Education, what would you say the benefits of taking the approach that you're suggesting, threading it throughout and making it a big part of the education system from primary through to secondary? What would the benefits of that look like? Like how, how would it sort of improve the way we um, yeah, educate, engage in our time at school. Yeah, so uh, a, lot of t a lot of teenagers, personally in my experience, not that, um, not, not like super self-absorbed, but are pretty like centered around what they're doing at the moment. And I think that learning about the SDGs sort of opens people up to being able to appreciate and think about other things that are happening in the world and sort of creating that kind of awareness and by ingraining it within school it means that students aren't having to put an extra time to learn things because I find that that's where you get disengagement especially from like teenagers is when it's an optional thing or it's extra on top of what you're already doing where students take a take take a step back and go ah oh, I can't be bothered it's or you know it's it's not for credits so I don't want to do it like type of thing and to be fair like I'm guilty of that sometimes too because it's just like I don't know just as a teenager there's heaps of kind of stuff you're doing and um times or something to consider but I think that with having that ingrained in way in the, in the way that it's done it creates sort of an environment where students are just learning about it and you, you don't really question necessarily like why you're learning about it it's just sort of what you do and then yeah it's able to kind of help people be able to further think about other things and then they might carry on to um in their life just applying or having more knowledge and awareness of like the how the how they're living and how that impacts the environment even if it's just something as simple as that where they're making an effort to um just walk more than drive their car if they can like and just because they've had that sort of learning around it in high and and from primary up all the way through to high school where they're just more aware of what what impacts that yeah yeah, all good points, really. Thanks, Kira. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Kira, for your thoughts. Uh, Sean and Jocelyn, thanks for your engagement and questions there. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we had hoped um, that all of these conversations would be intergenerational in their nature. 
Um, and we still hope to do that in the future. Um, Jocelyn and Sean and I have some ideas about how we could potentially progress um, some regional uh, intergenerational conversations in this space. So um, just watch out for those. We, um, we hope to be um, looking at opportunities for that later in the year, potentially. Um, it's uh, an opportunity for me to, sh to share a few thoughts now with you. Um, and uh, I'll try and be very brief here because I think, uh, you know, uh, some of the points that Kira made there are, are, are really pertinent um, and I really would like to give some more opportunity for Jocelyn and Sean to share some of their stories too. Um, but very quickly for me, I'm an academic, I work at Ara Institute of Canterbury and I lead um, a programme in sustainable practice, a master's <laughs> programme, um, but I, I wasn't always an academic, I used to be a school teacher, um, I was a, a health and physical education and outdoor and environmental education teacher previously. Um, and I guess uh, through my postgraduate studies and, and through my um, move into tertiary education have become more and more interested in um, sustainability and, and the sustainable development goals. Um, I, what I'd like to do um, is just share a few broader thoughts, uh, perhaps from the literature to give us a bit of a, a sense of the big picture. And one of the first things I want to do is draw from um, an author uh, who is uh, one of my favorite authors. I had um, a privilege of spending some time with David Orr um, whilst I was living in Australia. He came down and spoke, spoke at a conference that I was helping to organize in Tasmania. Um, many of you may be familiar uh, with his work. Uh, one of his books, um, which was originally published in 1994 and then the 10th anniversary edition was published in 2004. Um, I think there's some wisdom uh, in, this, uh, in this book from David Orr, which um, still holds true with us today. And I'd like to just read uh, very quickly a couple of quotes, um, if I may, from his, from his book. Um, so he would, uh, David Orr would argue, the conventional wisdom holds that all, all education is good and the more of it one has, the better. But the truth is, without significant precautions, education can equip people merely to be more effective vandals of the earth. If one listens carefully, it may even be possible to hear the, hear the planet groan every year in late May when another batch of smart, uh, degree-holding, but ecologically illiterate homo sapiens who are eager to succeed are launched into the biosphere. The truth is that many things on which our future health and prosperity depend are in dire jeopardy. Climate stability, the resilience and productivity of natural systems, uh, the beauty of the natural world, and biological diversity. It is worth noting that this is not the work of ignorant people. Rather, it is largely the results of work by people with BAs, BSCs, LLBs, MBAs, and PhDs. It is a matter of no small consequence that the only people who have lived sustainably on the planet for any length of time could not read, or did, or like the Amish, did not make a fetish of reading. My point is simply that education is not a guarantee of decency, prudence, or wisdom. More of the same kind of education will only compound our problems. This is not an argument for ignorance, but rather a statement that the worth of education must now be measured against the standards of decency and human survival. The issues now looming so large before us in the 21st century. It is not education, but education of a certain kind that will save us. I mean, David Orr wrote those um, words, um, you know, almost 20 odd years, well, some of those words 30 years ago, um, and then they were revised 20 years ago, and I think they're still uh, really uh, pertinent uh, for today. Um, another uh, scholar that um, I have really enjoyed reading and was quite, has been quite influential in my thinking um, is Stephen Sterling, and many of you will be familiar with his work. Um, again, this book was published 20 years ago, where Steve, Stephen Sterling talked about revisioning um, education. And at that point, um, part of his argument was to suggest that most mainstream education sustains unsustainability through uncritically reproducing norms, by fragmenting understanding, by sieving winners and losers, by recognizing only a narrow part of the spectrum of human ability and need, by an inability to explore alternatives, by rewarding dependency and conformity, and by serving the consumerist machine. In response, we need to reclaim an authentic education 
which recognises the best of past thinking and practice, but also to revision education and learning to help assure the future. Again, uh, words from Stephen Sterling uh, penned some 20 odd years ago, uh, but still uh, very fresh in my mind, and I think very pertinent uh, to the situation we find ourselves in now. Um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, there's a little bit of research around that tells us a, a bit about sustainability, environmental education and climate change education and where they sit in our schools or how they've been worked in our schools um, in, in recent years, um, particularly some of the work of Rachel Bolstead, who works for NZCEO and um, uh, Nami to, to Rachel and to her work. Um, some of this research tells us that by and large, um, environmental sustainability and climate change education um, are largely sitting at the margins of schooling rather than being weaved um, into uh, uh, the heart of what it is um, that is happening in our schools. And I think in many ways that was reflected in the corridor um, by Akira um, and Jocelyn and Sean just a little earlier. I guess with this in mind, um, a recent article um, produced just a, a matter of months ago in a prominent journal called Environmental Education Research um, by um, for um, of the world's leading environmental and sustainability education researchers, um, Alan Reid in Australia, um, Nicole Ardoin in, in the US, um, Nicole Fer Ferreira, uh, sorry, uh, Joanne Ferreira in, in the States, um, and Justin Dillon in the UK. Um, and again, they were, they were coming back to some of the words of David Orr um, in another book that he published called Ecological Literacy in 1991. Very quickly, um, uh, to, to read through this, and, and in this article, they were talking about the warnings that come through from scientists, like, for example, the, I, the recent IPCC report. Um, to return to awe, it is especially important that we critically assess and respond to the call that all education is reoriented towards sustainability worldwide in ways that make sense to the context and challenges that citizens, young and old, face. And it is especially important to keep in mind that on average, the nations and social classes with the highest education levels still tend to have the highest rates per capita consumption and relatedly the largest ecological footprints. Indeed, warning after warning, how we have responded to the decades of many of the same patterns in people-planet relationships strongly suggests that we are not learning or being taught. In short, humanity continues down a self-destructive path that is destroying the planet. To this end, while each warning proposes that scientists, the media and citizens work together to pressure political leaders to prioritize and address these challenges, we must also consider the role of education both critically and creatively in influencing and shaping any of our individual and collective behaviors. So I think that's a, you know, that's a really up-to-date um, sentiment, which is reflecting some of the similar sentiments that um, Sterling and Orr um, reflected earlier. The last um, piece of reading that I've been doing recently, which has been strongly influencing my thinking, um, as a Pākehā male who is uh, on a journey in becoming Tangata Te Tiriti um, and acknowledging my place um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and my engagement with Te Ao Māori, um, this book, Imagining Decolonization, um, has been is, is brilliant. I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, Ocean Rebecca Mercia, who was a speaker at the um, 2018 um, New Zealand Environmental Education Association conference, um, has got some wonderful uh, uh, just some wonderful thoughts here around um, decolonization and the importance of um, of engaging in that process for us. So I think um, as we think about education in this country, um, uh, te tiriti o watangi, um, te ao Māori, maturanga Māori are key components that we have to weave into that journey. Uh, so to quote uh, here from, from Ocean Repeka Mercia, decolonization involves rethinking and then action. Educational theorist Graham Hinegaro Smith puts it as conscientization, resistance, and transformation. The thinking begins with a recognition of colonization in all its forms and guises. Decolonization involves critical self-reflection and outward observation, 
It seeks to embody pre-colonial, indigenous and non-colonial paradigms. It unearths and addresses embedded colonial thinking. Decolonization then takes individual and collaborative action to root out the weeds of colonization and provide a space for indigenous ways of knowing and being and more besides. Altogether, these actions can lead to radical personal and societal change. So I think uh, for me, these thoughts of uh, around decolonization and obviously um, that process needs to be led by Māori, but as Pākehā, we can be, um, we can be allied uh, to that process. Um, that this is an important component as we think about sustainability and the sustainable development goals moving forward. Um, so that's all from me. Um, it takes great pleasure now to hand over to Jocelyn and then to Sean, who I, I see personally as two um, of the shining lights um, of uh, environmental and sustainability education in this country have been involved in this area for many, many years. Um, and it's a great privilege for me to be able to work alongside them in this workshop. So, um, Jocelyn, I'm going to hand over to you. Kia ora, um, Alan. Thank you. Uh, ko Jocelyn Packerall, Taka Ingoa, uh, kei te mahi au, ki te kainohera tai au ki waitaha, i kai tahu tahu whakauru tai ahi ahau. Uh, I work at Environment Canterbury as a Youth Engagement Education Advisor. Um, but before joining Environment Canterbury, I taught uh, Geography, Social Studies, Education for Sustainability and a few other things at, at secondary schools. Um, this can take a few minutes just to, to kind of tell a little bit of my story. Um, what drives me as an educator, I, I have a passion for the amazing world we live in. So I'm driven by this passion to support young people develop the capabilities that will enable them to inquire, to explore, to collaborate with others as they strive to understand and, and gain new knowledge. Underneath that lies my fundamental belief that state education should provide equality of opportunity for children, meaning that all children and young people should have the equal chance of getting a good education, whatever their ability or aptitude or whatever disadvantage they may face elsewhere in their lives. I left classroom teaching a number of years ago in part because I was frustrated with the system in a number of ways. The uh, reforms of the 1980s, the tomorrow's schools and the continued neoliberal thinking with the tinkering with education, as well as, as, well as with other aspects of society, um, hadn't helped. Um, we had, however, I believe by 2007 developed what I saw as a curriculum that opened up possibilities for a more localised, place-based, connected education with a vision to strive toward of our young people becoming confident, connected, actively involved, lifelong learners with a growing backpack of capabilities. But the major paradigm shift in terms of the pedagogy needed to realise that vision was too slow in coming for me, partly due to the ministry not really funding good comprehensive PD programmes for teachers. And I think uh, Kira kind of pointed that out. A lot of teachers have become a bit siloed. Uh, they don't have time. They're, I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons. And, and I think we can canvas some of those in our conversations in the breakout rooms. Um, like Alan, I, I refer to um, Stephen Sterling's book, and it's a, it's a well-thumbed book in my household. The seminal um, um, sustainable education, revisioning, learning and change helped me understand more about what the par a paradigm shift could look like. I actually cried when I read that book. And when I shared it with a colleague uh, and she read it, she said, she tossed it back. She said, what a load of old cod's wallet. And it kind of confirmed to me there was a bit of a round, round peg and a square hole. It was a square, square peg and a round hole. Um, so from that, I connected with other educators working in the education for sustainability field. And I found that I had found my place. The principles in education for sustainability and the pedagogical processes offered a great framework within which to work. And um, have you gone on? Yeah, this, this um, diagram is, is one that Dr. Barry Hill about Barry Law put together a few years ago, and it's just showing the interweaving of all of the um, aspects of sustainability. It is it is a whole way, it's the lens that we can use to, to look at whatever kind of e uh, educative process we're, we're um, into. Next one, please. Alan? Yeah. Um, EFS is essentially transformative, constructive and participatory. It's changing who we are by changing our ability to participate, to belong, to negotiate meaning. Um, in short, we have the tools and you've 
got some of the principles there in front of you. We have the tools and a framework that help that could help us in gender change and achieve sustainable development target 4.7, but they're either not known about, poorly understood or unsupported. So I must acknowledge there, there are a few educators, and I know that there, there are some here on, 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 this, on this hui here, uh, that are implementing really wise EFS programs, and I hope they'll share their stories in the breakout rooms. Uh, next, I think. Um, oh, tackling wicked problems such as um, the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss actually require real shift in thinking and behaviour. It's not a matter of continuing to do what we've always done, just with better technology. We really do need to reflect on where we are and consider how, how things may operate differently. So if we go to, back to that backpack of capabilities I talked about, if we're going to realise that SDG goals of all learners acquiring the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable lifestyles, promote a culture of peace and non-violence, and God, do we need that kind of culture, then educators need a clear understanding of what transformative learning looks like, sounds like and feels like, and what an eco ecological education paradigm and culture could, uh, could provide. And this is where I think the whole concept of eco-literacy, making sure that we engage all aspects of of, of our learning, the head, heart, hands and spirit. So we do need an education that sustains the whole person. Uh, it's in, we need to equip young people for lives of compassion, thought and purpose. And schools, I don't think, can provide this alone. It truly does take a whole community to educate the whole person. And in this respect, I believe schools need to operate within the community, with the community, not just within it. And so cutting to the chase, this is why back in the early 2000s, a colleague and I created a course for senior students called Sustainable Futures. Uh, this, it was at Christchurch Girls High School. And through this course, we explored four main aspects of sustainability through a number of authentic contexts. Uh, just click a couple more times, Alan. Um, we, we'd bring in expertise into the classroom, we'd take students out into the field, encouraging them to partner with outside agencies, we facilitated that program for two years and received positive feedback from students. And you'll see some of the kind of quotes we've, we've captured from young people um, through these programs. Um, and they, they felt they were better prepared to engage with uncertainty and to draw on diverse strengths of others to address issues. Um, and I, I think that's really important that in context, transformative experiences where the head, heart and hands and the spirit is, mm -hmm. is engaged. At that time, I also began working with the Untouched World Foundation. Next one, please. Um, and some of you may have heard of this, this organization. I became one of their facilitators for their experiential leadership programs. And each program is predicated on the fundamental principles of education for sustainability, connecting young people intellectually, emotionally, and physically to issues and places. Our programs are transdisciplinary and challenge them to think creatively and critically to ask the why, the how, and the why not questions, and they develop action competency through leadership. And I, I mean, every time I run these, I'm, I'm challenged as well. And I think it's transformative for all that participate. Next one. Through my role, and just click four times, but through my role in Environment Canterbury, we've partnered with the Untouched World Foundation and other groups to create um, authentic learning experiences for young people that build their ecological literacy and their citizenship muscles. And Sean Cavell was involved with this in, in the, while well, she was still working there as well. So it's about them becoming active, engaged, informed citizens, students. Um, they, they gain some strong civic knowledge and real experience and, and experiences of real life decision making on issues that matter to them in the communities. And from the environment Canterbury perspective, it is about natural resource management that we focus on like, like water. Um, so what's arisen from the opportunities we've provided for young people is, is the next, next slide, uh, is that they have demanded that they want to be able to engage at a political level much more effectively, to be able to speak directly to decision makers. And so the environment Canterbury working with young people has created the youth ropu, um, and that's where they can kind of realize their power of being informed and of giving voice to their concerns for now and the future. And that's, it, it, it continues to be a work in progress. It's an iterative process, 
we're learning as we as we create um, this together. But I know that councillors are finding it really interesting and um, challenging at times to be working with young people who have really got an eye on the future. So finally, our team of educators at Environment Canterbury are reflective practitioners. We do seek new understandings and challenges, and we challenge ourselves to improve constantly. To that end, this paper Rachel, of, by Rachel Bolstad, and of course her name comes up, she's been a, a great researcher on education for sustainability over a long period of time through the New Zealand Centre for Educational Research. But this paper from 2011 really stimulated debate within our team. And her, those questions that she's got there, how do, we, how do we think learning is carried forward from schooling into other aspects of life? How do we conceive of the role of schooling in meeting wider societal purposes? And where do we think individual and collective responsibility lies in relation to shaping and creating future? I thought they're really powerful questions that no matter where we are within that educative spectrum, whether we're in school or outside of school, I think they're really powerful questions to consider uh, when we're looking at what we're, what we're doing with schools. And it certainly made us and our team think about how and why we work with schools and with young people and, and, and their communities and how we may use the pedagogical tools that are already available to us for deeper engagement and action. And I think that's where I want to end is I think these questions that are here, as well as the ones we'll pose to you today, will, will lead to some really rich and engaging conversations about educational change. So, nami nui kia koutou. Sean. Kia ora. thank you, Jocelyn. I'm just mindful of the time it's ticking, so I might try and um, do a little bit of speed on this. So, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Sean Cabell tuku ingoa. Um, I'll briefly introduce myself. So, my background is as a primary school teacher. Um, I taught primary school for about 10 years, mainly in the North Island, a little bit of overseas. And then I got the horrible glandular fever and decided to do a bit of walking around the South Island and my, found myself staying in Ōtutahi Christchurch, where I worked as Jocelyn referenced before at Environment Canterbury for about 13 years, lucky number 13, um, where I was an environmental educator at first and then I led the education team there. But 13 years is a long time, so I decided um, with a bit of courage to step away from that kind of um, protective bosom of local government and um, go out on my own where I um, primarily support organisations to engage children and young people in matters that affect them and more and more um, that is involving climate change education as a really key focus of my work and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So some of you would have heard about this programme that was launched um, uh, early last year. Next one, please, Alan. So just a bit of background on the Climate Change Learning Programme. So this was developed as a pilot in late 2018 as part of the Regenerate Christchurch consultation with the South New Brighton community. Um, after the programme, the teachers and students sort of shared how much they loved the program, but more so that it just couldn't stop there because it was only meant to be one term and then that was it. They said everybody around New Zealand, all schools need to be engaged in this program. So the people I was working with and myself at the time went, right, here's the challenge, here's the widow, let's go and try and find some putia to um, build this program and make it national. And we were lucky enough to get some support from the Ministry of Education. Next slide, please. Um, so during that time, uh, 2019, we updated the program to make it um, national, nationally focused, and to also include the a wellbeing guide. So what we found through the pilot, um, of course, we know climate change is a huge issue and it, and it brings with it a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty, and we really need to support both the akunga, but also the teachers um, to work through that as an issue. So again, it launched early, uh, late January last year. The reaction was it was a hiss and a roar. There was quite a lot of pushback about it. There was a huge amount of um, discussion. There was some calls for the ministry to take it down, um, but really proud of the ministry. They didn't, they stood strong and they kept, you know, stuck to their guns and it stayed on that website. Um, which was wonderful. The agreement was 
that we would audit the resource in 12 um, to 18 months time. Next one, please. Alan? Um, so just as a little bit of a sidestep, another contract that I have is working with the Christchurch City Council and their coastal um, adaptation planning program. And this has been wonderful because it's allowed, <laughs> it's allowed me to um, teach the program as well as continuing to develop the program. So I have supported throughout Otatahi Christchurch 13 schools in loan lying areas with this program. And it involved me teaching four of the eight lessons and the teachers taught the remaining four. Um, and then ongoing support after that. So I thought it might be quite good just to share with you a bit of pre and post survey um, thoughts from the, I think it's about 800 students that were involved. So before the program, I asked them about what they knew about climate change already. And then thinking about what they already knew, how did it make them feel? So this is just a bit of a word cloud. Uh, next slide, Ellen, on it, how they were feeling before the program. And I found the answers to this question really interesting because as we launched it, we got a lot of criticism around, and I quote, child abuse by teaching um, climate change to children and young people that we were creating anxiety. And what this slide shows to me, what these thoughts show to me is, we know that children and young people know about this stuff already and there is a huge amount of anxiety. Their knowledge is good, but it's mixed. Some of it's solid, but some of it's not quite right, which can create even more anxiety. Next slide. Um, this slide shows some of the direct um, thoughts and feelings that were shared by predominantly year seven and eight students, but also some year six students. I tried to get a cross section of thoughts and feelings that were going on. And of course, there's always those that, yeah, they're just not really that bothered about it. Okay, next slide. So this slide is sort of post-survey. Would, would they recommend the program to other, other students? Um, so the vast majority, 90% said yes. So you'll note that little comment on the bottom right and corner, I don't believe it. Alan's asked me to elaborate that because I, I told him yesterday. So that's an edited version of the actual quote. And I just a bit of warning that swearing's coming in. The actual quote was, this is shit. I don't believe in it, you've wasted my time. So it kind of shows there's a whole spectrum of thoughts and feelings around climate change with children and young people as much as anybody else. Next one. So this is post-program. How do you feel about climate change now? So what this sort of shows is going through the program really helped them um, not only understand the science and indigenous knowledge behind climate change, but also most importantly, what can they do about it? It was empowering them and their voice as part of that intergenerational conversation around what is it that is climate change and what is my role and what can I do about it? So really emphasizing their rights as the child to have a say. Yes, Ellen, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the program has been extensively audited over the last, um, or since March to June this year. Um, over 32 organizations were involved and that included children and young people and teachers education and science experts and organizations such as NIWA and ESR, and also stakeholders such as Dairy and Z, Forest and Bird Federated Farmers. So we really tried to capture that whole spectrum of thought and understanding and expertise. So the program morphed into what you can see here, which is a user guide and eight um, different modules. First half kind of focuses on the science and um, indigenous knowledge systems, but the second half looks at more what can they do. And that includes sort of those meaningful connections, critical thinking and communication and different worldviews. How do I have those conversations with people who think differently? And how do I be a critical thinking with all that fake news that comes around? What is my part in this? And last slide, 
Um, I'm pretty excited about this because this has been an ongoing conversation with the ministry for over two years. So we're about to launch the updated um, learning program. We're in the process of progressing the Kupapa Māori version of the learning program, as well as the wellbeing guide update that will also sit within a Kopapa Māori Te Ao Māori framework. Um, next year, uh, the ministry has committed to putting this all as an H on an HTML um, format, so it will become a climate change education portal. And very exciting, Christchurch City Council have sort of moved to the next step of the learning program where they're going to engage about three students from five schools to be invited to the council um, to be involved in, a, in the coastal framework and they will be pulling together submission and presenting that to the council and that will be formally accepted and that's happening in early November. So yeah, mine's more of a on the ground practice rather than theory presentation, but thank you, kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Shan. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. That was wonderful. Um, and kia ora, Jocelyn. Um, I guess what we've tried to do there is to set the scene a little bit um, around, uh, you know, a bit of historical thinking and contemporary thinking around some of the broader issues related to education and its relationship to sustainability and to our future. Um, we've shared some some ideas around um, pedagogies and teaching and learning. Um, and we've actually shared um, a, what we believe is an example of um, a, a system, a systematic um, improvement or change or development that's happening in the education space with that climate education uh, resource. Um, so we've got it. This is uh, this next slide is our co-papa, um, and I'm going to hand over to Jocelyn to talk about the what and the how uh, for these conversations um, that are about to take place, and we're going to put you into breakout rooms shortly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, Alan's um, I've put up there um, a link, links to a couple of uh, a Google Doc and a Padlet link that you're going to be using. But firstly, our, um, the, the kind of com the co-popper of the conversation is you've got these key questions in your breakout rooms. Um, and, and I really think the people have already put up a whole lot of ideas. There's some great stuff that's been coming up in the chat and some really good questions as well. You can see how difficult it is to bring uh, what would have been a quite a dynamic, um, interactive, face-to-face -face, um, workshop down into, um, into a one hour online. So let's see how you go. Um, so those are the questions there in the Google Doc and uh, you can get that on the link that's in the chat. So how do we enhance positive changes that are already taking place in education? Where do we see opportunities for, for change? What are the voices of children? How are the voices of children and youth included in the process? And uh, Dr. Barry Law put a good question in the chat about that one. How is partnership with Tangata Whenua to Ao Māori and Matauranga Māori included in the process? Some really good questions there. Um, the how, um, but just a reminder that it, it's really important. We don't know who's going to be in your, in your in the mix in your breakout rooms, but just everybody that, that comes into the space has valid and legitimate um, things to share. Um, and please, if you if you do recognise that you've got some younger ones in, in the um, breakout room, give them a chance. Please invite them to have a chance to speak. Let, let them speak first so they can share some of their experiences. And just those, the usual co-papa of um, being respectful to each other, listen to different perspectives. And uh, if you want to ask a question, do so, but in a way that um, doesn't deny the, the, the validity of uh, what other people are bringing to the space. So, uh, yeah, go and have some really rich conversations. As I said, the links are in the, um, uh, on the on the Google Doc, and then if you can record your action points in the Padlet, and you'll notice in your Padlet, uh, when you get onto that page, there's breakout rooms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you, you, you click on the little cross in the middle of the circle, and then you can start writing comments. All of you can start doing that, but have those rich conversations before you start doing a whole lot of writing, and we've probably got about 10 minutes. Uh, no, I think we'll go for 20 minutes, Jocelyn, because we've Excellent. got through till quarter past uh, one or, and we Excellent. can even take a little bit longer if we need to. So Thank I think you. we'll take 20 minutes. So welcome back uh, to the main room. I hope uh, that those uh, conversations were fruitful, uh, were constructive. 
Um, yeah. And we're possibly even uh, a little bit inspiring. Can you hear? Um, Listen to the man. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, look, just wonderful to have you all with us uh, here this afternoon. Um, I've got the Padlet open up on my other screen here, um, and all, there's all these amazing um, comments um, that you've made there. Um, I, I popped into a, a room, uh, and I'd like to give a bit of a shout out to Lizzie and Harriet, um, who are Year 11 students um, uh, at a school here in, in Christchurch, uh, Rangiruru College. Um, I popped into their room, and one of the comments they made was that, um, you know, often people talk about individual individuals making change, and that's all very well and good. But you know, from their perspective, they saw that um, that broader systemic change was was crucially important, um, and that we just can't leave it up to individuals um, to make changes. So, um, you know, I think there's some sentiments there that were echoed earlier um, from Kira, um, and we, you know, we really. Uh, appreciate uh, the voice of those young people who have come to join us today. I see Emma also um, was in room eight. Um, uh, and so, yeah, any other um, youth that were with us today uh, uh, in this conversation, um, we certainly really appreciate your, your involvement. Um, and as we said earlier, we had hoped that uh, this session was going to be um, really intergenerational in those conversations. It wasn't quite as we hoped, but it was wonderful to see uh, some of those young voices there. Um, uh, Alan, I suggested to, to our, our group, and Kira was in our group, and we had a um, really good interchange between her and Dr. Barry Law. Um, I did say that we hope to arrange a face-to-face -face one when we're down to one level one or 1 1.5 or whatever we're going to have, because I think to, to carry on this these conversations, to, to, to put our critical and creative hats, thinking hats on around educational change is really important. And we do hope to kind of share this uh, as part of the, the mix going into the, into the curriculum change that's occurring at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, great point, Jocelyn, and good, great to be reminded of that. So I think uh, Jocelyn, Sean, and I have an idea to collaborate with um, NZAE, the New Zealand Association for Environmental Education, who are um, across the country, um, and looking at how um, you know we can uh, potentially have uh, using this this co um and and to work in in some intergenerational conversations across the country in different ways. So um, watch that space. Uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Um, Folks, it is, uh, we have got a little bit of time now. It probably feels like um, this morning was quite rushed with the technical issues we had, um, but we have got in, uh, through until 3 p.m. before the next session starts back in the main room, which is our closing uh, session for the day. Um, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that um, the Padlet, which you all um, have the link uh, for, um, is, uh, is, still up you know we're not going to close that I think we might leave that Padlet link live for the next <laughs> uh, through, through to the end of end of tomorrow even um, even possibly the weekend um, uh, what I'd like to do is if, if you would would like to stay involved in this conversation in some ways if you'd like to um, you know to see uh, you know what's in the Padlet moving forward um, pop your email into the chat function below um, I can then save that chat function. Uh, I can I can save all of your your emails and then send an email out to everyone um, with a bit of an update uh, on where the where the conversations are going um, from this particular workshop. Uh, and we can also uh, make sure you get included um, in the communications that will potentially go out around some of the face-to-face -face intergenerational conversations around education 2030. Uh, revisioning education in Aotearoa um, for a more sustainable future. So please um, pop your emails into the chat. I see lots of people doing that now. That's wonderful. Um, just before we go, can I uh, just give a huge uh, shout out to Kira? Um, obviously, she's my daughter, so I'm biased, but I think she's pretty fantastic. Um, so uh, Kira Nami, uh, Kia Koto, thank you for your involvement um, today with us. Um, Huge uh, shout out to my friends um, and colleagues, Jocelyn and Sean. Um, just an ab absolute privilege working with you um, uh, on this session and, and really keen to um, you know, continue thinking about how we can advance this kaupapa throughout, uh, throughout the country. 
Um, and then lastly, um, uh, nā mihi kia koto to everyone uh, who has been involved with us today. Um, you know, really appreciate your input. Um, appreciate your uh, your the way that you've conducted the conversations in the rooms that you were in. Um, and uh, you know, we have such important work to do uh, in the educational space. Now let's be inspired. Let's be positive. Um, no, and let's uh, be be collective in the way that we move forward together because um, you know the waka needs many paddlers. Um, we can't do it by ourselves. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, kia ora rawa atu. Uh, thank you very much for being involved. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, Alan, can I just add to that? I'd just really like to um, uh, show the appreciation for the teachers who actually entered into this. I know how difficult it's been for them since um, we've, they've had to be teaching online. And I, I think they've, um, the, the contributions that they've made and the support they're giving to young people is really important. So thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jocelyn. Also, well, enjoy a break uh, now and we hope to see you back uh, in the main session uh, at 3 p.m. <laughs>